Hi, how's it? In the name of Christ, how you doing? It's Garabo. It's your girl Crank, hey? I hope you're good, I hope you're peachy, I hope you're Stella, and I hope you're in a neat little bunch. If you're not, welcome to the party. Is that just not the story of our lives? Okay. Whoa, alright, look, you know what? Spiritual war, it doesn't matter. Because guess what? I'm gonna win. And when I do, you're done for. You can't imagine that you can continue to roll around in these streets and all of this insensitivity, never mind insensitivity, but just a general crazy and be good. I was wondering last night why the Holy Spirit, even though yesterday I was cool-ish, more or less, you remember the last video I did, I was kind of jocose, I was singing. Uh, and yet, last night, before I slept, or early this morning, before I slept, I was suddenly overwhelmed by a lot of Holy Spirit. I was overwhelmed by a lot of fire like I was cool and yet it's like the Holy Spirit went from 80 to 120 and immediately when I felt the increase of the I guess portion of God's girth around me when I when I felt that my heart sank because I know that that only happens when I'm about to be violently attacked. And here am I, violently attacked. We're gonna talk, yes, in this here is an interlude. I am boiling hot, even though the sun is setting or has set. I'm just hot and I can't switch on a fan. That's not dandruff, it's white car sunscreen. So please. Have mercy. This here is an interlude. It is a video between videos. So there will barely be any editing. Only thing that is going to be edited is just my lighting and I will certainly be adding makeup. But more than anything, it's just going to be like that raw. Put it in a template that already exists and publish. The topic of the day is brain okay first and foremost it's thursday the 21st of november 2024 and as at the time of starting to record this it's uh, 6 p.m and the reason why it's so late in the day because i tend to come a little bit earlier is because i didn't intend on recording um because i just wanted to take time off because i can i did let you guys know two days ago that i'm gonna have to record back to back because of the level of spiritual abuse that is on me then maybe I might be given a break after five or six days of just back-to-back -back recording. And here am I on day three. Okay. The topic for today is brain-eating amoeba calling themselves women. Y'all, um, just because you can do this to a person, just because you can cause an individual to feel some kind of way, because you know how to use witchcraft, honey, does not mean that you're finally going to get to that person. Women, I did let you know that largely the Lord is going to leave you to endure the tribulation, etc. All that. And basically live to regret the crappy thing you are. Okay? Yeah, but I did also let you know that if you continue to sit on my chest like a log, just swaying left and right in your body, in that state, imaginative that you can keep on trampling me underfoot while I've got a big job to do. If you stand in between me and ministry, if you stand between me and what God will have me do in this season, if you stand between me and the work I must fulfill, Honey, just like any good old-fashioned man that is a Corobella junkie, you will go to eternity, you will not see the rapture, you will not experience any and all 
at all. Grace, you will just be squashed underneath God's palm because frankly you're a menace, you're a tonsil. You're a vestigial organ like an appendix. When you flare up, you cause a great deal of pain. However, the body can do without you. This world can do without you. You are absolutely irrelevant in the grander scheme of things and yet you're pushing a particular agenda. Of course, there will be a remnant of you women that will do better and walk away from me. And then others will even take it one step up and actually repent. They will be spared. But as for the rest of you ghostly beasts, I do apologize, rest in peace, except without the peace. Okay. Mamelang. So you can gauge just what a disastrous thing you've become in society. We get that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And we also get that really and truly very careless men when they're just roaming around these streets doing whatever careless men do they produce something very ominous in women but what must be comprehended is that this ominous thing created in women even though it was as a byproduct frankly of rotten men it is far more destructive in its manifestation than what men can ever, ever, ever do. These guys dance around playing with fire like little children, only to cause homicidal, murderous battalions of female soldiers that utterly decimate literally a country. You rise up in an evil, quite the voluptuously diabolical matriarchy in an attempt to replace the patriarchy and then you destroy like everything in your wake and so while these flapping fishies outside of the ocean that are about to breathe their last called men are out here getting judged by god passing away from the thing that they started the dominoes they tipped you are basically taking the baton from them and proliferating, continuing to finish off, essentially steamroll over that which is the last remaining goodness in society. I do apologize, naivete. You are wearing it like a garment. You are not going to succeed. You are not going to get very far. You're going to start a particular ominous thing and a dead beat in the center of your cray cray. Herein lies the comprehensive deal perish much vibes you are about to experience the same plunge into the eternal lake of fire the abysmal condemnation that you brought onto yourself like your husbands like your male colleagues like basically all these men that have been destroying the whole country you are going to die with them like you are them you are going to be no different from them the way that you are going to be swatted out the way albeit feeling <sighs> feverishly like you've been done dirty literally nobody cares albeit feeling feverishly like you've been done a bad blow nobody cares when over and above being a victim you are the be all and end all of the baddest perpetrator in the game i did warn you women that if you don't move out my way like men you will die that god is picking largely a bone with these miscreants in the street that just fart and poop on a spot then walk on without cleaning the area called men these defecators like little animals on the street that have no regard for the fact that nobody wants to be gazing upon fecal matter just lying there sticking up a storm with a dog walker being the only person responsible sufficiently to pick up this poop and throw it away because, I mean, how's a dog gonna get that done? Mm. These men who have littered the earth with feces, listen up. The Lord has been the dog walker out here scooping the poop from the grass at the park. But then you women make a decision that there which the Lord scooped poop, you're just gonna go and squat and do your own little number two i do apologize you will just sit there and never stand again you will cease to exist you will breathe your last you will very simply be taken to eternity because here and last the deal nobody gets to patronize jesus 
Nobody gets to patronize God. Nobody gets to get God sweeping a room from whatever in there is causing filth. And then you just rock up and muddy it with your ugly shoes. It's not going to give. Women, you are not the be all and end all of the thing that is supposed to be the bane of my existence. And so I apologize if you're feeling feverishly like that's going to happen. Listen, I was not going to record today. Until a woman wreaked havoc in my life, I told you I live on the property with a drunk. Listen. I have a preference. Look over there. That is a cup of coffee. This here cup of coffee is a unique cup of coffee. It belongs to me. Like a prescription that's very particular to one particular human being. My coffee is like a prescription. It cannot be stomached. My coffee is like a diet plan. My coffee is like, how can I describe it even better? It's bespoke. It's made specially for me. It's like an outfit that has been made for a person with disabilities. A person that is missing one breast a person that is missing one buttock cheek a person that's missing an ear that has half a neck a person that has no arm and no foot and on the other side no leg at all so they're walking on a stump this individual cannot merely walk into woolies and buy pants, buy a top, buy a halter neck, a polo neck. This person cannot just walk into True Worths and buy some shoes. This individual cannot just merely walk into any random joint and buy that which is going to conceal their bodies from the elements that they might not be nude in the streets and so offend us with all of their nakedness. This individual must necessarily, because of all of their disabilities, have all of their clothing tailor-made. They have got to buy bras that can accommodate one breast while scooping the empty zone over here. They've got to buy underwear that is going to nonetheless fit despite the fact that one buttock cheek is missing. They have got to buy pants that are made in such a way so as to enable folding for the one leg and also accommodate that on the one side they're fatter than the other leg. So the one side has to be thicker and girthier with more material than the other side. They have to buy special clothes. They have to buy a halter neck that's a little bit shorter otherwise it's going to be too much material because after all he's got half a neck. Or she's got half an egg. If at all this individual, upon having all of their wardrobe made for them by a tailor, a bespoke tailor, a tailor that makes bespoke garments, bespoke, for those of you who are not aware, means specially for you. It's something that's made just for you. So a bespoke wedding gown, only you have it, nobody else exists on the planet that has it. It can only be done because your tailor measures you. They grab a measuring tape and they encircle your breasts, realize that you don't have a breast on the one side, then your waist, then your hips, then your one leg that is thinner than the other leg, blah, blah, etc. And in terms of shoes, seeing as you don't have both feet, but you need to put something there, you're chilling on a stump, then this tailor will make you socky type shoes. Just to cover your stump. You are a person with disabilities and your disabilities are so exquisite, so extreme, that you have got to have every last one of the items of your clothing made for you. Or if you go to a store, they must be altered, those things which you purchase from the store. Very well. So if anybody of your siblings, anybody of your friends, anybody of your family members 
Should they rock up like a bat out of hell and make an insane decision to just wear the outfit that you've put on the bed, prepared it, following taking a shower. You've put your top there, you've put your bra there, you've put your belt, your pants, which have got two different legs for sizes. The one is thicker than the other. You've put your, 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 your socky shoes there. You've even put your halter neck there. And it is obviously that which you are going to now wear after taking a shower. And then somebody, your sibling, your mom, your dad, your this anything, cousin, somebody around, friend, seeing this outfit that has got half an arm, half a neck, a particular oblong disposition about the breast area of the top, a bigger size on the one thigh than the other, and shoes that nobody else can wear except this guy then goes on right ahead this little sister of yours to just wear your garment herein lies your baby sister walking in seeing your clothes prepared hearing the shower water with this outfit on the bed you are obviously about to wear it and then they make a decision while you're in the shower to wear that outfit and then they alter it to basically fit them so the halter neck is a bit shorter because that's your neck and then they just grab it and they stretch it the top is only there to fit you so they just grab it and they stretch it the side of the leg that is thinner they just grab it and stretch it so it can fit their legs and then the worst part is their shoes they're not supposed to fit on feet they're supposed to fit on stumps and even then one stump because remember you don't have a leg on the one side and then they go and they somehow try to make that socky shoe a regular shoe when you're done showering you then go to the bedroom to basically get in your outfit that you've prepared for the day and you discover that it's not there what would be the first thing that you would do when you discover that your outfit is not there any rational person you will probably be irritated that oh who moved my outfit but then you would probably check the wardrobe again right maybe they put it away because they were neatening the house maybe they stashed it and so you will look in every cupboard where they could have potentially put your stuff away and then rewear it again without starting a fight but then you don't find your outfit and then you ask little sister where is my outfit that was on the bed and this little sister can hear you audibly and then they say nothing you're right there they don't have a hardness of hearing where is my outfit i'd lain it on the bed to wear it after getting bathed you're sitting there standing there in a towel rolling there in your wheelchair in a towel you can't even finish what you need to finish because the thing that you prepared just before showering is gone and your little sister just keeps quiet it's not even like oh i'm sorry I didn't mean to use your outfit. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize it was your outfit. Oh, I'm sorry, I put it away in this particular wardrobe, forgive me. That is the rational, reasonable response that you would give if you were not going out of your way gratuitously to pick a fight with the person with disabilities. If you mistakenly wore an outfit that cannot possibly fit you, you would say, oh, I'm sorry, I wore it by mistake because I liked the jacket. I didn't realize that you were going to wear it. After all, you left it on the bed for so long that I thought you'd given up on it. A response is what says, I was not going out of my way to harass you, 
to jostle you, to coerce you, to castigate you, pillage your peace. I was not going out of your way, out of my way, sorry, to declare war on your particular turf. I just mistakenly and innocently, honestly, just, you know, grabbed that which was obviously not mine because I imagined you'd neglect it to need it anymore. That's what a person that wasn't picking a fight, but that, you know, out here did something that was disquieting to a person that wasn't, was expecting that not to be done. Make no mistake, I'm at war, okay? I'm at war, I'm in a voluptuous, bountiful, feverish, hot war. And because I'm at war, I don't take prisoners. I am not like before. We have got leg room, shock absorbers essentially, you just take trash in my stride. Me, I throw things everywhere. Me, I am trying to preserve my life, I'm trying to live, I'm trying to make it to the next day. I am trying to survive a heinous cornucopia of death curses coming from entitled feces called men. I am trying to escape that which is the determination to take that which does not belong to freaks. And this war is a hot one. It is violent. It's got static electricity. And it's also got a current of an electric eel. I am a jellyfish. I sting unto death if people don't leave me alone. I am not in a regular season and so therefore I am what they call perpetually agitated irritable. I am what they call a ticking time bomb, and yes, I do explode. No, I will not deny that perhaps maybe my reaction is not 100% biblical, but I will also put this out there. The Lord has compassion on me because he remembers that I am made of dust. And the Lord also knows that attrition sometimes causes what would be the tantamount of acts of indiscretion that are out of character because a person is under too much pain. He remains faithful when I'm faithless for he cannot deny himself, plus he is aware that I'm not invincible. So when I've been cast headlong in a hard knock feverish hot battle, where in the midst of all of this fever, I'm out here popping that popcorn in a pot in the midst of a whole bunch of oil, comprehend that whatever indiscretion I may walk in in this season because of the crazy climate that I am encircled by because of spiritual war, the Lord will look at it like it ain't Jack after all. My sins are forgiven me past, present and future. They are removed from me as far as the east is from the west. So comprehend that if I do not turn the other cheek and I slap you back, the Lord is going to hold me back and be like, you shouldn't have done that. But then guess what happens on the other side? Forgiven. Paid in full. Guess what also happens on the other side? Rapture, should that happen first? Or if I die, oh, look at that. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the, de of the, Lord is the death of his saints. Guess what happens? My redemption anyway. Me going to heaven anyway. Essentially what I'm getting at. Animals. Is that y'all can't afford to be messing with Christians because if you push us to the nth degree of ourselves anticipating that we're going to perpetually just maintain a godly demeanor in reacting to you, you're putting your lives at risk, in danger, in the midst of people that can't go to hell, in the midst of people that can't endure an epitomal final judgment, a people that cannot be taken to the comprehensive precipice of the end of themselves for they have been ensconced by grace individuals that can never ever be essentially guilty of anything you are missing with spoiled kids essentially have you ever dealt with those children before that can do absolutely nothing wrong in the sight of their parents this kid is always pulling out people's hairs, stealing stationery, giving teachers a hard time. Yet this kid is an heir whose dad has got connections with the president of the land. And so there's really no escalation that can be done that can ever cause a parent that will inevitably, with undue favor, always take the side of his child. There's nothing you can ever do when this kid frustrates the living daylights out of you. They will always get away with it. They will never get expelled from school. They will never get kicked out of home. 
they will also never be grounded. They will just come back eating ice cream the next day after you told on them. That's the travesty and the sorrow of the souls of the wicked when they afflict righteous men and women until they can't maintain piety anymore. It is written in God's word that the scepter of the wicked shall not remain on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous should turn aside their hands to do evil. It is also written in Romans 7 that <coughs> where sin abounds, grace abounds evermore. Understand that when you go and you grab a child of God and you make them essentially unable to keep their cool, you're messing with a person that should they make a decision to finish you, they'll bounce back. However, with some guilt on their shoulders, they'll feel sad, tormented by the fact that, oh my goodness, look, I killed a man. We go to jail, but not for eternity. The earth puts us through due process in court only for us to break out of those chains when we die or get raptured. We are essentially free indeed in ways that you can't comprehend. So really to mess with us, really not guys, not in your best interests. The Lord will intervene every so often and send a little bit of an Abigail to David to stay David from committing genocide. But you must comprehend that when David does a worthless deed anyway, the promise of God does not get taken away from him. You know, the man after God's own heart, he almost killed a whole village of men in the story of Abigail, Nabal and David. But then later on, the same dude was not stopped before he did a strange thing. Later on, he went on right ahead, saw a woman at a distance, liked her, took her, raped her, had a baby with her, killed her husband, and just continued to jump up and down, acting like nothing happened. He got a slap on the wrist, because that's exactly what getting away with murder is. Getting away with rape is. He got a slap on the wrist, because that's exactly what acting so crazy in the climate of being a king and so ought to be a lot more responsible is he got a slap on the wrist cried a little bit released some tears wrote psalm 51 broke it in a contrite spirit you will not despise oh god don't take the holy spirit from me and god was like relax i won't take it from you but i'm gonna give you more slaps on the wrist where your life is gonna be hard but at the end of it you're going to write me a big fat chunky psalm again and say thank you for delivering me from all of my enemies yeah it's the disciple that gets away with all murder because they're a disciple you can't mess with god's children even when they're naughty okay so when you then put us in the position to be naughty i literally apologize it is at your own peril because should the lord should sorry david make a decision to finish you off anyway as nabal you're the one that goes to hell i do apologize while David are just dealing then on that day with blood on his hands that, like I said, God is going to spank him for shitting, but he will not throw him away. We cannot be thrown away. You are messing with individuals that cannot be thrown away where as y'all are throwable, y'all are throw awayable. You can be cast into a dustbin, an eternal one, just burning forever, an inferno in a picky up plastic bag because you are refuse and yet you're messing with people that are always just being picked up and dusted off like an ornament that is precious that falls on the floor and the person in question that owns it out here running to see if it's not cracked up because oh no my ornament fell and then they dust it off dust it off dust it off and make sure that this time around they put it in a glass cabinet where it cannot escape because I love my ornament. We are precious ornaments in the sight of God that must be protected at all costs. That the Lord will run 2,000 kilometers over hurdles and mountains to ascertain that we don't crack when we land on the floor. Though the righteous man may fall seven times, he gets up each and every single time. But guess what happens to you wicked men and women? You are suddenly overcome by calamity. I do apologize. The Lord knows that I am made of dust and so he has compassion on me. 
Jesus Christ is aware that there is a great deal of attrition. People are out there trying to poke and prod away at the apple of his eye. They're trying to make me feel so frustrated that I will keep on sinning against God by being intemperate. Essentially very aggressive, angry all the time, breathing fire like a dragon. You think that me not being able to turn the other cheek but instead throwing stones? You imagine that when I cannot, essentially, since I know sin, nonetheless cast the first stone, you think that if I make like the Pharisees and nonetheless stone, the adulterous woman, you think I'm going to hell? I'm sorry, no. It's called grace. That's where it applies. Where sin abounds, grace abounds evermore. You don't get to push us to the nth of ourselves and think that we're on equal playing ground here because all of us are just crazy. No. The spoiled brat kid who can't do nothing wrong will always frustrate you in school. There's nothing you can do to tell on them. There's nothing you can do when you are just trying to hook up a caucus of other students to petition to get the student fired from school or expelled sorry you can't get rid of them because their dad is the headmaster their uncle is the president of the country their uh second cousin twice removed is the minister of education like you literally you can't you can't this you can't win you can't win you can't win especially when that kid is not generally naughty but they just keep on getting bullied for being basically a prince or a princess for being an heir they get bullied for being the kid whose dad is the headmaster. And so, I mean, if you're going to go and grab a good kid and make them push you on the school playground, then you're going to go cry. And so look at what this good kid did. I apologize. All of the strings that can be pulled by this good kid's entire family are going to be pulled and you're going to be violently frustrated on the other side that this good kid did, did that which you said, ah ha ha, gotcha. No, I'm sorry. All that happens when good kids sin is they write Psalm 51. And they say a broken and a contrite spirit you will not despise. Every so often God is available sufficiently enough to stay them. Stay them. Yeah, that's what's good. From committing genocide as in the case of David with Nabal and Abigail. But sometimes the nth degree of crazy happens in the life of this kid. And then he gets, like I said, a slap on the wrist. Because is David in hell today? No, I apologize. He is not. We all know. He is called the man after God's own heart. Despite having committed all of those indiscretions, he is nonetheless called a man after God's own heart. So when you get me banging doors and screaming at the top of my neck and throwing out maybe even expletives, I apologize, I am still filled by that very Holy Spirit that rose up from 80 to 120 degrees last night. He was there in advance, prepared the day ahead, knowing that I'm going to get stung by bees, hit with multiple arrows, have a fire just thrown in my camp. And so I am going to react in the fever of all of this unadulterated attack, like this gratuitous, just unwarranted, however, nonetheless, a scoopy attack. Because it was like a scoop of ice cream all up in my grill, voluptuously just around and cold. Came at me. And my response was ungodly. But guess who's still filled by the Holy Spirit? You can't imagine that you can throw me in a whole bunch of attrition and then God will forget about me. I'm not you. When you sin, it's like just another Tuesday. When you sin, it's just, oh, they've started again. You're like, indeed. I mean, you know the junkie, they can't do anything right. Hey, that kid that's always stealing everybody's purses. That kid that after you have hung out with them, all of a sudden your sneakers are missing. You know that kid. That kid that everybody does not trust. They cannot be sent to the store to buy bread because he's not going to come back for three days. You know those kids. They're at it again. They get yelled at even when they've done nothing wrong. Because everybody always suspects them of strange stuff. That's you guys. You're little witches. You do strange stuff. You are the ones with the bad rap. You are the ones with the bad attitude. And you are the ones that even when you try to do better, frankly, don't nobody ever trust you. And so for those reasons, you will perpetually be frustrated by the goody two-shoes that even when they do wrong, nobody wants to yell at them all day long. People ask them, oh, but why did you do that? There must be something wrong. Like when a good kid Aja, fails a, a subject at school. The parents would be like, is there something wrong? Do you need to see therapy? Does something happen? Are you okay? 
What's up? This is not like you. But when a bad kid fails, because he's been failing all this time, they just keep on getting yelled at. Oh, daddy, lo, obvious, duh. You're gonna amount to nothing. At this rate, really, I don't even know what your future looks like. Nobody's out to trying to figure out what's wrong with him because he's always been like that. And that's you. You see, you can never be me. And that's the thing that is out to eating you alive like maggots on a cadaver. I'm the good kid. And in the season of hostilities against my person, you are frustrated by how God just keeps on slapping my wrist and moving on. You don't get to bully me into obscurity and anticipate that this is going to end well. You don't get to bully me into obscurity and anticipate that this here is something that the Lord is going to rebuke me for. You don't get to act a cray cray fool all up in my grill and expect even the world around in the midst of miscreant kids like delinquents that are known for delinquency. You know, you, you can't possibly imagine that the world is overnight going to change its mind about me. No matter how many doors I bang and no matter how in a spirit of a whole violent amount of pain, sorrow and anger, I then release an expletive. You can't imagine that anybody's ever going to start to think of me as that unregenerate sailor, that, 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 that depleted no-brainer, that cancelled psychopath. I do apologize. I have a reputation that speaks for me. I am above reproach. And when I act out of whack, when I fail at last, it is concern that is raised in the bones of my encircling environment. They be asking me, are you okay? This is not like you. That's how heaven sees me. So please, why are you busy handling the washing? When they can't do nothing wrong? I, I like I just don't get it. We we don't go to hell. We go to heaven. No matter what. Yes, the Lord might slap us on the wrist. The Lord might pinch us like a naughty little girl. But live we will. Eternal life we will inherit. Promises will be kept where we are concerned. Past, present, and future will our sins be forgiven us. Far as the east is from the west, so too will the sins that we have be removed from us. We have chosen the pearl of great price wherein the ark we can't take, get taken out from the hand of Christ. But if a Christian finishes you because they are unholdable, they are unrestrainable, they are so angry that they cut off your head, I'm sorry, Nabal, you will go to hell, to hell straight away. You can't afford to keep fighting Christians because if we kill you in our anger, we don't go on death row. We just wear orange. But guess who's burning? That's exactly actually what Christians are like. Every so often you wreak so much havoc in our lives that we, pe we put people in the grave. Only for us to just go through a life term. I don't know how many times I have come here and said, I don't know why men are insisting on taking me. Because Mina, I would end up in Sun City prison, loco, whatever. I would end up a prisoner because I would have killed my husband. But then I would have, at the end of my life, died and gone to heaven. But the person that I killed will be in hell. You cannot afford to fight people like those. Like, y'all need to gain perspective. The way that you bully the church, like, gain perspective. You are messing with people that can literally do nothing wrong. We are not generally bad girls, bad boys. We have evidence of fruit. But when we slip up, when we fall, when we falter, according to the scriptures, we get up each time. But you are suddenly overcome by calamity. So if a saint hits you with blunt force trauma until you're on the ground and you code, you'll go to hell. While that saint will deal with guilt for the rest of their days, wish they had exercised restraint, Feel like their garments are dirty until they die. Never be able to sleep again. But guess what? As soon as they flatline, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have fought the good fight. You have ran the race. You have kept the faith. Enter my rest. But where are you? <sighs> Weeping and gnashing your teeth for all of eternity where the smoke of your torment rises forever. So, women, I'm going to be the thing that takes you to eternity. 
And while it will sting, while it will hurt, while it will absolutely obliterate my heart, bottom line is, I am going to live to tell the story while you will be in hell. You are getting warned time and time again. And like my relative that out here, Ali, Alimo, Alimo, Ashem, they are sending themselves hitting the ground running to hell. I can do nothing wrong. I'm the saint here. And when in the middle of the heated feverish war that I am in, you then poke and prod away at me, you're risking your own life. You're risking your own life. So, I mean, when you're going to go and grab my bespoke coffee that I have prepared on the kitchen counter and you make a decision to drink it and then when I ask, where's my coffee? And you don't even respond by saying, oh my goodness, no, snap, I'm sorry. Like, I do apologize. I, I didn't realize, I didn't think you were going to drink it. So I drank it. When you don't even say anything, but you're just here, your mom, you are on that day, of course, not even trying to appease my wrath. You know how it's written in God's word that a gentle answer turns away wrath. You're not even trying to help me understand what happened there. Hey, you left it on the kitchen counter for two hours, girl. So I just thought, let's not waste some coffee in these streets. You don't even give me an answer. You're basically telling me I am trying to crawl up your nose like a feather. I'm thoroughly trying to get in your hair like a tick. I am doing everything in my power to crawl in your piping like a rodent. I'm doing it. I am trying to screech and control myself and make funny little noises like a geriatric coughing with emphysema. Like piping in a house that is very, very old, causing people therein to not be able to sleep. I am literally trying to agitate you at that height. I am, I'm obviously, I am dull. Like, that is what I'm doing. Then I'm going to be like, but what did I do to you? How many times must I tell you, Unkochel? You remember the video the other day that I did, that I shared? Speaking about how this little drunk... Called up my skirt and took out my drinks from the refrigerator and just left them on the kitchen counter so that she could fill up the space where I had put my drinks with her whatever her juices and I spoke about how my reaction was to take her juices and throw them on the pavement and then in her room and then bang the doors all over the show because why or oh why under heaven are you taking my things out the fridge you're not the only person that lives here I took yours and I moved them to another part of the fridge and yet you took mine out of the fridge altogether and then just stashed the whole entire fridge with your junk. And how I reacted by basically grabbing those leaky fruits and throwing them on the pavement. On that day, I was already suffering an exquisite amount of spiritual war. There was already a death spell in operation. The guy from America was busy burning candles. A whole bunch of guys from South Africa were out to trying to get me to commit suicide. I had had a whole bunch of suicide dreams. I was enduring spiritual war and I was about to come and record a video and try to make myself feel better. I was just going through it in my own body. And then this person decides to grab. You see, that's just the thing. I'm like a skinned animal or a skinned person that is still very much alive. Or a person that has been burnt that is still very much alive with no morphine. Mm. The smallest little feather hurts. The braise of a feather hurts. I'm sensitive. The smallest little offense hurts. I basically overkill. I overreact. I shoot a fly instead of swatting it. I am presently in so much spiritual war. The small little buzzing flies get whammied out the way with a hand grenade. That, that's how it is with me right this moment. Please make no error. I am sensitive at present. I'm skinned. Don't come here, not even with your feather. And try and stroke my skin. I will punch you into eternity. I'm attempting to save my own life. And while this indiscretion is mild, meager, it's worthless. On a normal day, when I'm a normal person and I don't have 20,000 witches all up in my nostrils, like snot 
I'll just leave it, turn the other cheek, indeed employ biblical principles. But when I am already tipped over in terms of how much affliction I can endure for the day, when spirits are out here chanting, die, 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 behind me, when I have to find whatever louver I need to find to escape the temptation to take myself out, and then you come at me and you grab my, 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 my drinks and you put them on the kitchen counter, you're begging me to just basically give up because everything is falling apart that can fall apart. You're out here fulfilling Murphy's law. If anything can go wrong, it's gonna go wrong. You are essentially adding insult to an injury you are under normal circumstances, quite frankly, ignorable. But today, no, you're not ignorable. Why? Because you're out, you're putting one small little feather light pin on top of an already overloaded weight of junk. It's going to capsize, capitulate, crash, burn. If I do not whisk that needle away with a racket a tennis racket i won't even remove it with my finger i am going to whisk it off with a tennis racket i'm gonna overkill and then and then when you have the grand imagination that i'm going to be regarded on that day as listen to this intemperate short fused struggling with anger management i do apologize no among the fruit of the holy spirit is temperance or gentleness like just a tranquility about yourself but you see we're not invincible the holy spirit with with him we put to death the deeds of the body but we still make war with this body of death like in romans 7 right we are still out here striving with the flesh so when satan and his minions feel as if they can just pile on a whole bunch of trash on us paul comforts and says that where sin abounds however grace abounds evermore but indeed, the Lord does give us the Holy Spirit that we might be helped along with the deeds of the body. We put to death the deeds of the body. But if the devil overwhelms us with sorrow, Paul makes it clear as Christ is communicating to him to write that holy word. That where sin abounds, grace abounds evermore. You can never ever put a Christian under so much pressure that they will stop being seemly in the sight of God. We are propitiated for by not our own justice or our own righteousness but Jesus we are imputed on righteousness that belongs to him and that's why we get away with murder however because we have the Holy Spirit we make war with the flesh we don't just capitulate to it but should we should we capitulate grace abounds evermore that's where that's applicable when you are just striving making war with the world and the world decides that they're going to add more insult into your injuries and then you decide to respond by just shooting it in the head The Lord will be disappointed. Following which he will give you a slap on the wrist. And at your death he will say, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have fought the good fight, you have run the race, you have kept the faith. You cannot ever outdo a Christian. And you can never ever accuse a Christian of being intemperate, hasty, feisty, when you have gone out of your way to harass them in a way that is observable in a way that is clearly the act of attempted assassination my coffee is bespoke no one can drink my coffee because frankly it's a menace to most I put eight teaspoons, maybe even eight and a half of sugar. I put three, maybe three and a half heaped teaspoons of coffee. I then put a whole bunch of pepper and then some fenugreek seeds and a, a little concoction that has got a whole bunch of spices in it <clears throat> in a jar. And I don't like it with milk either. My coffee is strong and extremely sweet and very spicy. It's not for everyone. It's it's not easily takeable in one stride, especially considering I clobber it with pepper. pepper. It's hot, yeah, Baba. No one can grab my cup of coffee off the kitchen counter and sip on it 
and finish it unless they have that acquired taste for it. My fat, my mom only takes three teaspoons of coffee, of sugar, sorry. My sister, she's watching how much sugar she brings in. She's got a whole health consciousness going on. That makes her even more culpable for this rubbish. When you are a careful health nut trying to keep your, your waist at bay, and then you grab a gargantuan mug of coffee on the kitchen counter whose contents are literally up to here like the way that there's so much sugar so much coffee so much all of this stuff like it's here and then you mix it you may you put in water well when a person happens upon that much whatever is in here on the kitchen counter and then you decide that you're gonna go pour water in it and on top of that add milk which I don't take with my coffee. And then when I ask, where's my coffee? You then don't even respond. And then I go in and I discover that you took it, you made it and you added milk on top of that. Of course, I'm going to throw my toys out the car. I'm going to bang the door and I don't care if you're in the phone, you're on the phone. You're going to be understood as one that lives in a very chaotic environment with whoever you're on the phone with why did you take my coffee and right next to the coffee that she made was some other cup of coffee that she had earlier made so she basically mixed up my coffee and told herself i'm gonna irritate the living daylights out of her following me throwing my toys out the car she then started to speak some stuff that i could not even understand that was inaudible incoherent incoherent and i was like you know what this woman <sighs> Yes, yeah, like it, man. Like, Satan is like a jockey. And she's a horse. Man, how she just gets ridden. Man, how people out here be hanging on her and she just gallops. She is what they call a vessel of dishonorable use. The Lord has set apart everything for his purposes, including the wicked for the day of trouble. I live with someone on the property that is just easy come, easy go. And I did let you guys know that carry on using her. But understand that I've got power above that woman. Carry on using her. And she's going to keep on having her juices thrown out the window. Big fat chunky arguments happening while she's on a call with important business clients, doors being banged and her speaking smack. And then turning around after two days and feeling like trash for what she did, then trying to talk to me who is out here not even trying to hear what she has to say. And that little yo-yo that she is, is just going to be the torment of her soul until she finally leaves me the heck alone. I need you to understand that this here manifestation by my sister to do these weird things to me, it's something that in and of herself she cannot sustain. Next time she's going to think twice. She's going to remember about her leaky fruit on the freaking pavement. She is going to remember about how I yelled and screamed and threw my toys out the cot. While she was with a client or something on the phone. Or while she was with you. While she was with. While she was talking with people I don't know what. Who she was with. But they certainly overheard all that. The last time when she wreaked the havoc that she reached was also with people on the phone. So these people be thinking she lives in a very turbulent home. Except no, it wouldn't have been all that turbulent. If you had just left my, my drinks alone, if you had just left my coffee alone. Why are you coming at me? My coffee is bespoke. It is like that outfit of the disabled person. When you decide to wear it, it doesn't even fit you. You don't even like it. You can't drink it. Ain't nobody can drink my coffee here. No one. It's too sweet. And it's too strong. And it's too hot. It's hot. Like Tabasco or say. Like chili pear, like chili sauce or something. That's my coffee. If your stomach is not used to that much heat, to that much pepper, it'll give you a stomach cramp. My coffee. It's an acquired taste, do you understand? Can't nobody drink my coffee without using the toilet seven times a day. It's taken years of me getting accustomed to it. But it's mine and mine only. Other people will literally be up and down the toilet for, for the whole day. Coupled with stomach cramps. I implore you right now, actually. Go and grab a heap of pepper. And then just eat it sonor. Just like that. And tell me if you don't get a stomach cramp. Because that's how much pepper I put in my coffee. 
go and grab a heap of pepper and put it in your stomach roll I, I, I drink two of these cups of coffee a day so basically it's like 16 teaspoons of sugar over there so is it not wonderful how maintained i am hmm? no weight gain nothing because the lord got this i drink those two cups of coffee in my fast so that it can take me to that uh, the end of the day where it is that i eat my one meal because i'm busy fasting and it's super super peppery it will give anybody a stomach ache i not only drink my the pepper in my coffee but sometimes i just take it and develop it well. so as to overwhelm my senses senses if i get a headache and there is no painkiller in, in the room nobody can take the amount of pepper that i take and not get a stomach cramp so when you put water in that bespoke cup of coffee you are literally trying to get at me you can't drink it you won't drink it but you just want to cut me because you can but you see the ramifications, the ramifications, and I've been saying it time and time again, the consequences of cutting me always hit her. She comes back after two days and she tries to force an a greeting on me. She tries to force talking to me and I'm like, I don't want this nonsense. I don't want you. Leave me alone. You are a vessel. You are usable. You are a horse. And the kingdom of darkness are freaking jockeys. They just ride you. I am in too much spiritual war. I can't deal with you. So women, just like my sister, just like this drunk, just like this woman who ought to be drinking some peppery coffee even though she can't take it in her stride. You're like brain-eating amoeba. And you're about to die. I cannot have a The dreams that I got, like proper. Y'all be out here trying to take what you can't take. You are like Goldilocks. I need the loot.